guest today is Tracy McCubbin. She is the CEO and owner of Declutterfly. You can find her website at dcluttefly.com. She is also the author of the book, Making Space Clutter Free, the last book on decluttering you'll ever need, and is a regularly featured expert in the media, including the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Home and Family, NBC, and much more. As you'll hear in this interview, Tracy is very passionate about what she does, and it comes through in both her speech and the expressions you'll see on the YouTube video. I really enjoyed having this time with her to talk about how we can declutter our lives and make more sense of our daily routine. One other important piece during our conversation towards the end was to talk about OneKidOneWorld.org. Tracy is the co-executive director of this organization, and they are doing amazing things over in Kenya and South America. So please check out OneKidOneWorld.org. Also, please reach out to Tracy on Instagram at Tracy underscore McCubbin. Her last name is M-C-C-U-B-B-I-N. If you have an issue with being unorganized or clutter, whether it be your home, your office, your closet, your garage, or anything like that, please check out her website and by all means, reach out to her. Once again, thanks for listening. Now sit back and enjoy this interview with Tracy McCubbin. Tracy, welcome. I'm glad to have you on the podcast. I've been waiting to have you because clutter is is just the worst thing in the world. So I'm excited to talk to you. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. I'm super excited to be here. And it's, um, it's always interesting to me, people sort of who have different expertise and different focuses, like everybody has clutter in common, everybody. Yep. So yep. it, um, it's just, I love talking to different people about kind of how they can manage their clutter, get ahead of their clutter and, you know, live their best life. Well, I'm excited. And I, I follow a pretty strict format in the sense that I really like to know the person. And I think my audience likes to know the person. And I think that's how they connect with you. I just don't want the end of this podcast to come and say, oh, there was this really great woman that was on who understands how to declutter. I want to know how you got into this and and more about you. So can you kind of give us the background leading up to when you started Declutterfy? Yeah, it's a very interesting subject. I like to say that um, I'm one of those people who all, I I had a bunch of jobs that turned out to not be my passion, but everything I did along the way brought me here. So I was a personal assistant for a very long time to two different people. I was a bookkeeper for small businesses. I was an administrative assistant to lawyers. I had all these various, I took care of my grandmother, helped her with, you know, manage her finances. So I had all these various kind of office centric jobs. And then when I was working for one of the people as a personal assistant for, he was a television director. So when he had downtime, um, friends of his, or he, you know, offer, you know, say to friends of his, oh, my assistant, she can handle anything. So I started helping other people. You know, somebody's grandmother had passed away and they needed to clean up the house. They had a big accounting mess. And all of a sudden people started to tell other people and I would get phone calls. And at first I wasn't charging. And then I was charging a little bit. And a friend of mine said, you know, I think you have a business. And I was like, what? No, I'm just helping people. This is, and he's like, no, that's what a business is. (laughs) And so I, I was like, all right, let me just see. And I made a little website and I put the word out and that's 14 years later and eight employees later and thousands of jobs and, you know, everything I did in the past from, you know, acting in commercials to doing bookkeeping to taking care of my grandmother, it all led me to creating this business. And then the big piece of the puzzle, which I didn't even realize when I first started the business and I had to have a client of mine point out, um, I'm the child of a hoarder. So my dad is an extreme hoarder and I have lived my whole life watching him struggle with his relationship to his stuff. So very, uh, 
acutely aware of our relationship to stuff is emotional. And, but I'm not kidding. It was like 10 years into my business when this client of mine, who's a psychiatrist was like, that's so interesting. Have you ever thought like of the connection? I was like, what? No, what do you mean? (laughs) And then I was like, Oh, so, you know, watching what my father went through and still continues to go through gave me so much empathy to people's struggle and, you know, how for so many people, there's all this shame around it. You know, I'm messy and I'm disorganized and I'm a bad housekeeper. And my goal and what I realized through clients and my dad is that that's not the case, that there's this emotional attachment. And if you're not aware of that emotional attachment, you're going to keep repeating the same mistakes. So it's getting to the root of why you're hanging on to all the stuff and changing your relationship so you can live, you know, have the home you want to live. So I'm a, um, I'm late to this business. I opened this business in my forties. So I'm also a really good you know, poster child for like, if you have something you want to do, don't get stuck in the age. Don't think like, oh, I didn't get this done. You know, my success has all come in my 50s. So I'm, I'm like, if you have a passion, follow it. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. Yeah. See, and that's, what's great because my audience, at least what I think is my audience is really entrepreneurs. Like that's most of what I like, because that's where I come from. My heart is in that. So I like that you said all of what you just said, I, to encourage people out there that have an idea that haven't made the, the commitment to go forward with it. So that was awesome. And I read the part about, I didn't know what family, what person it was in your family, but I read that you had a family member who was a hoarder. So I'm glad you brought that up, but I, I wanted to know like what your trajectory was when you started, like, did you, what, what oh, did you want to do? Like, oh, this oh. is, this is even better. If you, if you, <laughs> this is, if this is your conversation, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur, okay. right? That I, uh, I just, I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, oh, let me just start a business. It'll be fine. Oh, let me just charge X an hour. Like I just made up some number, which was clearly too low. And then um, I think about a year into my business, I read a book called The E-Myth. Is that right? Am I getting the name of that? Uh, Yeah, Yeah. it's a great book. And I and I did the math and I was like, wow, I'm working for four dollars an hour. (laughs) Like when I when I realized how much time um I was putting in and what I was charging. And another real like I like when I say I had no business, I'd always work for other people, I'd always, you know, put things together, but I didn't. I didn't go in with this, you know, I didn't have a business plan. And I I learned so much along the way. And every misstep was a giant step forward. And the biggest change for me too was when somebody said to me, you know, you're not charging for your time. You're charging for your expertise. Mm -hmm. And that just switched anything. Because I had a lifetime of dealing with someone and their stuff. And that just turned a light bulb on like, oh, right. It doesn't matter that this business has only been open for a year. I have 40 some years of doing this. And when I thought that, and then I started to, you know, read more and like realize, and I hired a business coach and I started to really shift things around. That's when the business took off. That's when I was like, Oh, stepped into the role of being an entrepreneur. And then I started to hire employees and then I became a boss. Right, which is a whole other thing. Yes, how it do you is. take care? How do you take care of your employees and how do you serve your clients and how do you not work 24 hours a day? And so I love being an entrepreneur, but it was it wasn't an easy journey. It's not like, oh, just open your own business. I would do it no other way. And mm-hmm. I had to stay really clear about um because I, I fall a bit into the imposter syndrome, like who am I to open a business and who am I to do this? And it's like, no, 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 you've worked for, you know, I've worked since I was 13. I've had job, like I know how to do it. So I had to take all my past experiences and filter them in and realize that even though the path didn't look like a linear line, I didn't get an MBA, I didn't get venture capital, I didn't, you know, I have just as much experience, maybe more. So I always tell people, you know, um, in some ways, you're not reinventing the wheel. A lot of people have done this. So gather information, you know, listen to podcasts, read books, hire a business coach if you need it. Like you can do it. If you have a great idea that no one's done, 
you know, follow it through, follow it through. So I feel, I feel really, I I love it. I love running my own business. I love it. It's hard. Yes, it (laughs) is. It's hard, you know, and some days I really, you know, I, I, um, I just got a text from a client. We helped them with this fundraiser that they were doing, and it was a very emotional cause. And my team went and we kind of helped them organize all their stuff for it. And, you know, it was just a very grateful text. And when I get those texts, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. this is why we do this. This yeah. is why we do this. So, yeah, I have a very funny, like, I, you know, it was not a straight line, but all roads have led me here. So I'm going to just, that's where I, 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 you have to bear with me for a moment because I want to know more about Tracy. So I want to know, okay. like, were you a neat kid? Like, like, what did yeah. you do? Like, like, <laughs> that's like yeah, so yeah, I want yeah. you to go back a little further. So <laughs> okay, like, we'll go, yeah, go back absolutely. as far as you want, but I just want to know, I want, I think it's important because where I am today everything like, and you, you are saying all the right things for all of the listeners that will listen to this is that everything that you've done in the past just adds to who you become now. Right. And it'll continue that way. And so many people lose sight of that. And I, at one point I did, I was like, Oh, I wasted so much time. And then I look back and I go, wait, that helped. And that helped. And that helped. And I learned a lesson there. And so what did you do? Like, what was, what did you want to do? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I um I was a neat child. I wasn't uh crazy, you know, crazy, crazy organized, but I had a pretty between my dad being a hoarder and my parents getting divorced, you know, I had a pretty, you know, California in the 70s. Like I had a kind of chaotic childhood. Uh-huh. There was, you know, everyone parenting was being reinvented, school was being re- we lived in a van for a year, traveling through <laughs> Europe. So um I definitely like to make order out of chaos. I definitely like to know, okay, this is my space and I can live in it this way. And I also grew up very close to both of my grandmothers and my grandfather, but they came from the Midwest and Fresno and were farm farmers. You know, they came from, and one of my grandmothers was an immigrant from Scotland and they all lived through the depression. So, you know, my generational experience, the sort of generational trauma of living through the depression, living through world war two, you saved every yogurt container, you saved Mm -hmm. every rubber band, Um, you know, learning how my ground, both my grandmothers were, you know, you don't put it down, you put it away and you fix. And I learned how to sew and I learned how to um, change it. You know, I can change the oil in my car and I can change a tire. And, you know, I had all these really practical things. And also for me, I think one of the big lessons that really served me in opening my own business, um, when I started working, I started babysitting when I was 12, 13, and I started making my own money. And I was like, oh, I can buy that blue shiny satin hang 10 jacket that I really want. No one can tell me like I learned, especially as a young woman, that money equated freedom, right? That this money that I made also could make mistakes with it, rack up some credit card debt. Like I could do that, but oh, if I work and money comes and I have power over this and my grandmother and I, you know, we bought some stocks and she kind of helped me figure that out. And so it was a really, that was one of those life lessons that they don't teach you in school, that this is making my own money. I want to take a trip, then I can do it, you know, and that was, and I'm a worker bee. I'm hardwired that way. I like to work. So I think it was, I think a lot of my childhood was, was trying to make order out of chaos and having control and having power, um, you know, and I was very blessed. Like I got, to, I went to UC Santa Barbara. I went to a great college. You know, I had a lot of um, opportunities. My family was very pro-education. So, you know, I traveled the world, you know. I, so again, it's all these things that um, at the time, like, I don't know, you know, I was going to live in Italy for a year to study art, the smartest thing. Yeah, turns out it was, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> you when know, was that? Out, I did that my junior year of college. Wow, that so, was that's you know, awesome. And yeah, was there so, were you was there something that you were wanting to become? Like, did you aspire to be? Or you know, was- yeah, it was funny. I never, I, I for a while, I I thought I wanted to be an actress, and so I took acting classes, and I did that. I had some moderate 
moderate success, but I didn't like the business side of it. And then I was, so for me, it was a lot of um, figuring out what I didn't want to do. Uh-huh. Like it was like, oh, you know, and I, because I'm a hard worker and I'm industrious, kind of whatever job I had, people were like, we'll promote you to manager. We'll make any of, and it was a very much a series of like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to spend the day doing this. And when this business started, it was the first thing that I was like, I want to do this every day. Like the rhythm of it, the helping the clients, the feeling of satisfaction when it was done, it was the first that I, I mean I liked other things that I did but mm-hmm. it wasn't I was like oh I want to do this all day every day like I you know technically I, the joke is I would do it for free well there was like a year I did do it for free <laughs> 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 it's literally like when well, that is a brutal I'll tell anybody the entrepreneurs people starting a business track your hours track what you're getting paid do that math because it'll gut punch you and it'll make you rethink everything. Like when you realize, oh, I'm working for $4 an hour. No, 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 no. That's an important lesson for everybody. And it makes you really rethink things. So it really wasn't until this, um, until this business started that I realized my purpose. Right. And, and if I remember reading correctly, it came out of you being this sort of this assistant to this Uh Right. And then a director. Yeah. 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 And then everybody you were helping, everybody saw all the stuff you were doing and it just went from there. And then you realized. And I'd always been, you know, I'd always been of service. And my grandmother was the like, my grandmother was the lady at the church who, you know, kind of did everybody's books. And she was the secretary at the church. And we were forever, if somebody was sick, I spent a lot of time with her. We would drive over to somebody's house and we'd make, you know, take them to the post office. So for me, helping people in sort of an admin sense was just a being of service. That's just what we did. We were your nice person. You help your friends. So I never thought about monetizing it. I never thought that it was a service that people desperately needed. Desperately. I was like, well, of course, you know how to move yourself. You just pack your boxes. No, people don't know how to do that. So when I realized that there were so many people that either didn't have the time, the inclination, and there was a way to offer this service, get paid, help them, you know, that was a perfect marriage. That was like, oh, this is a something that's desperately needed. And I feel like for um, kind of where we are in the world, it's interesting, but I think as we get further away from making things ourselves, you know, knowing how to sew, knowing how to cook, that there are more and more people that I mean, they can't do things for themselves. They just, it's, I, I, I know. you know, and you know, it's just, it's just a really interesting. Um, I'm a little worried. Um, I'm, you know, I have young nieces and nephews. And so I'm very worried about what they can, you know, do. And so I, I it's just, it's interesting that this has become a, a very desperately needed service. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. So the name of the business is Declutterfly, right? Correct. Yep. That's, Declutterfly. It's a mouthful. Declutterfly. Oh, trust me. Oh, and trust me. Here's another thing I'll say to aspiring entrepreneurs. When you name your business, say it out loud all day. So it would see if it's easy to come off the tongue and then try and spell the website because that's something else I didn't think about. <laughs> so when I give people the email, they there's DC, there's no E, yep. people leave it up. So do a little bit of market research. <laughs> Go, yep, can yep. I, can I say this? Yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. It's all those little things you learn as you're doing it. You print your business cards and people and especially you get older clients that want the help with, all, you know, some of these services that you have and the print's too small and you're just like, oh, my oh God. I went I, I went through that. I rebranded the company about two, three years ago and um, the, the, the designers did a beautiful job. And I was like, the font is too small. And they're like, what? And I'm like, oh, I'm like, they're like, but we have all, I was like, less text, bigger font. Yeah. Like my, the bulk of my clients are over 50, like make it big. Right. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I just, about a year ago, I bought my first, I bought a truck, a 17 foot truck. Cause we're so busy and I got it wrapped and it's like my traveling billboard. And I was like, nope, bigger bigger, mm-hmm. bigger, like phone number, <laughs> bigger. <laughs> and the guys at the truck, at the wrapping place were like, are you sure? I'm like, bigger, bigger, That's bigger. Awesome. <laughs> That's perfect. 
Okay, so you're um, you're. I know you have clients all over, um, but you're you're based out of California. Yeah, I'm based in Los Angeles. Um, Pre-pandemic, we were. Tra- I was in New York a lot, traveling a lot. Uh, post-pandemic, we're starting to travel again. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll go anywhere, but right for you know, it's been the book is Los Angeles and New York. Okay, perfect. So I, I want to go through the services quick because I want everyone to yeah. sort of understand. Um, and so I, I want to start with the home, the home decluttering. And it also on, on the website says office as well. And that's, that's an important piece for me and I think the audience, because if there are entrepreneurs out there, where, like my desk was clean a couple of weeks ago, and now I'm in the middle of doing a bunch of videos and I have research materials, and now it's starting to become something that I can't look at. So, <laughs> so yep. <laughs> let's start with that, the home decluttering plus the office stuff. And, and, and just a brief explanation of each so that at least we can get an idea. Of what yeah, that so that's great. So home and office decluttering is if your space that you live in or work in is unmanageable. I always tell people the really good litmus test is if you can't tidy up a room and make it you know presentable where you'd have somebody else walk in in 20 minutes or less, you have too much stuff. So that service is we come in, we help people sort through it. We help people figure out what they need to keep, what they need to let go of, um, and then creating systems for where it goes. So in an office, where do you keep your printer? Ink? Is it near the printer? Where do you keep your paper? You know, how much paper do you need to print out? Can we move you to digital? And, you know, if we move you to digital, how do you organize it? How do you find that? Because the really important thing in offices in the whole home, but really in your office is where do you put the things you need to keep so that you can access them when you need them, Mm -hmm. that you can go and put, and don't tell me, I know there's people out there that are saying, I know where everything is in my office and it's giant piles on their desk. I'm like, that doesn't count. You can't point to a giant pile and say, oh, I know what's in there. First of all, you don't. And second of all, (laughs) you won't be able to find it. Like, so, you know, creating filing systems or digital filing systems. And it's, And again, the really underlying message is this isn't about creating a home that you can put on Instagram or Pinterest. You can if you want. It's about creating a space that works for you. And now if you are working from home, pandemicing from home, schooling from home, all you got to make your space work. You just have to make your space work. They've done so many studies, they scientists, about the effects of clutter and stress. It just, this is all about that. It, sh- it raises your cortisol. So it puts you in fight or flight, your brain. Um, I- I'm sure you've probably talked about this on here, but decision fatigue, where you make so many decisions, your brain just shuts down. Mm-hmm. Well, every piece of clutter in your house is a decision. Do I need it? Do I not need it? Where does it live? So the physical and mental effects of clutter are very real. Very, very, very real. So my purpose isn't, again, to create, you know, I'm not saying be a minimalist. I'm not a minimalist. You know, it works for you. But is your home, is your office working for you? Is it working for you? Chances are for a lot of people, it's not. And that's okay. You may not, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Right. So if it's not working and if you have an issue with that, or if, if it's tough for you, you know, it, it, it's like, I always say, If you didn't know how to play the violin, you wouldn't beat yourself up. Like I wasn't born knowing how to play the violin. You might not have been born organized. You might have spatial issues. You might have ADD. There may be a bunch of things. So let's not beat yourself up for it. Let's educate and get it working for you. Yeah, you hit it on the head because clutter just causes me angst. Like I hate my Ugh. garage. I hate walking in my Ugh. garage. <laughs> and so I, I understand. Can you even walk in your garage? Cause I, it's only 20. <laughs> I, it's lucky I can. There's so many of our neighbors that have their cars in their driveway in the hot sun here in Arizona, because they have so much stuff in their garage. They can't park. And that was like priority. Number one, my car yeah. has to go in the garage. It's 113 only, out. It's like, yeah, only 25% of Americans can park their cars in their garage. Really? 75% of Americans who have garages cannot park their cars. In That's that. amazing. I know. I always say, I always say we put our $40,000, $50,000 cars on the street when we fill our garage with trash. <laughs> That's um, You know what? And you might, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I can't imagine what the statistic is of 
people that have storage units and how many times they visit that unit a year. I it just it's, I I could never bring a, myself to have one. I, I this is where I get on my soapbox. This is the thing I get on my soapbox because I knew this was going to kick I, something yeah, off. <laughs> it's a billion dollar industry, billion dollars. I have been in no exaggeration hundreds of storage units, hundreds. I have had clients who, because I make them do it, have done the math of what they've spent on that storage unit, mm -hmm. $20,000, $30,000, $100,000. I have never once, and I say this, no exaggeration, I have never once been in a storage unit where what's in there is worth more than what they paid to store it. It is a colossal waste of money. You will never go there. If you have something in storage that you can't access, why are you storing it? That's there is... It is I I'm like till I'm blue in the face. I'm like, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid. I have had clients crumble to their knees when they open it up and see what they've been saving. There's no, you know, there's like one or two slight somebody, you know, sometimes people are doing a remodel. There's a few mm -hmm. where I'm like, mm, I don't know, maybe yeah, let's see if we can find another way. It is, it is the just take money and like just burn it because it correct. is such a waste of money. Amen. I agree with yeah. you. I just, it's so funny. And I just figured I'd throw that out because I, yeah. I knew that was going to trigger. <laughs> yeah, no. And it's people don't go there and they don't, it's just really like, I, if I can convince anything to anybody, just don't have it. Don't yeah. have it. Don't yeah. get it. Because once you get it, you're never going to empty it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Real quick on the, on the topic of the home and office in right now in your business, how much is home and how much is off? like, and when I say office, I'm not talking about home office because I'm, I, I would think because of COVID home offices are on the rise because so many, right. So, yeah. but, but do you actually go to commercial office spaces to help CEOs? I do. And, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, that in COVID has just worn mm -hmm. down. We did, yeah. we haven't done any, but we have definitely, um, we definitely will go in, like work with big offices, like, you know, how do people use their space? How do people do that? I'm going to be really interested to see if that, um, comes back after COVID, I think mm -hmm. we're going to get a lot of those calls. The way the business sort of sh shakes out now, I mean, right now we've just been trying to get everybody offices at home. Yep. That was, that was like, how do you work from home? How do you school from home? That's been a big one, but it's probably, it's probably a third of the business is senior downsizing. A third of the business is our moving services. And a third of the business is decluttering. Mm -hmm. home decluttering and then probably 20 percent of that is office I, i'm excited i also think that when we go back uh how offices work are going to change yep. right because everyone's like open floor plan and now it's like oh, maybe not so much so i'll be curious to see how that goes i've also interestingly one two i've had a couple calls lately about um helping already help offices Office companies that are moving, small 10 people companies that are moving and setting up the office spaces before people even get in there. So that's a that's a thing that's starting to happen. And I Got think it. it's really how do you keep people safe in COVID and that kind yeah. of stuff. So that's that's always interesting to me. Perfect. Okay. Um, so let's go down the list here. So the next one that I have is closet audit. Mm -hmm. I, that's I, a good one. I yep. know. <laughs> so yeah I have a couple of the people who work for me are like they can make it look like the Carrie Bradshaw perfect closet so we come in we help you figure out what you wear what you don't wear get rid of the stuff that you don't wear we donate everything and then it's organizing like with like color coordinated matching hangers like it's really and and the thing first of all it looks beautiful but also your clothes are an armor that you go out into the world with and if you have, you know, if you have a business where you have to meet with clients or you have to go in and pitch your services to another company, if you start your day off digging through the laundry basket to put something on, you're starting at a deficit. You're already starting stressed. I wear the same thing to work every day. I have 10 shirts from the same company, 10 different colors. I have four pairs of jeans. I have my nice Nikes that are comfortable, but they're fashionable. I don't want to think about it. Yeah. I want to get dressed. I wear a nice belt. I look presentable, but I look like I can roll my sleeves up. I figured out what works and I don't think about it. Mm -hmm. I just don't think about it. And I start my day ready to go. 
It's not, my morning isn't about like, oh, what am I going to wear? What am I, you know? So people have to understand if your closet is disorganized, it's not serving you, right? You're already starting the day rattled. Where are my keys? Did I pack my lunch? And what happens and what people don't understand is, okay, so you're digging your clothes out of the laundry basket. You can't find your keys. You're running late. Oh, you didn't make yourself breakfast. So you're going to go through the drive through So you're going to you know, eat an egg McMuffin and a McCoffee. Like you've already set your day up so that you're not at your peak, mm-hmm. right? You know, if you knew, if your clothes were organized and you could get dressed, then you could make yourself that delicious smoothie that's healthy. You could start your day relaxed. And that's my whole like get out into the world ready to go, not frazzled. And especially if you've got kids like, oh, mazel man, those parents with the Zoom schooling, like to have that, you know, to have that extra, anywhere we can grab time, that's what the goal is. So if your closet's organized, you've just gained yourself 15 minutes, right? Oh, those are where my jeans are. Those are where my shirts are. Great. Off we go. Yeah. So that's a really closet. We love doing closets. We love it. We love it. We love it. And we do the really big fancy lady, you know, those, but we love closets. Let me, before we get off the closet audit uh, subject or, or what you do with closets, do you ever get in a situation where you go and, and they not only want you to organize, but they want you to actually help design a more efficient closet. And then you have yeah, to bring in yeah. like a, you know, a company that does all of the shelving and yeah okay yep it's a it's great we've i've really started um in the probably about in the last three or four years of service i i'll consult on construction so clients that i've worked with for a long time are building new homes or remodeling their homes so i'll come in in the design phase um and uh you know meet with the architect and the contractor and say like okay look this is how many pairs of shoes they have this is you know long hang this is so i love doing oh, cool. that. it's i love it it's a constant fight because architects do not believe people have as much stuff as they have Mm -hmm. contractors don't listen to i'm forever like the person that's like there's no broom closet you know and they're like oh uh you know (laughs) there's no broom closet they're like what do you need a broom closet for and i'm like we need a broom closet we need a broom closet so that's been really fun i i have been pitching it uh i'm working on my second book but i have been pitching for a little while i want to do a book so probably be down the road a bit, but I wanted to do a book between myself, an architect, an interior designer, and a cabinet worker Mm -hmm. about how to remodel or build houses in the most efficient way. So that's super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's super exciting. All right, cool. Um, We've already touched upon this a little bit, but garage organization. Mm, it's our favorite it's yeah. brutal it's brutal we 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 do it we got we have packages one two three days the team goes in there i'm at the point now where i don't do any more garages mm-hmm. i never need to be in a sweaty hot garage again yeah. you yeah. know fine. but uh my team's really good at it it's a it's a big and post covid this this one's been really people lots of people have been calling they're like we have so much toilet paper we have so much canned goods <laughs> um and that was one in terms of this is actually a great entrepreneurial point this was one of the services that i realized so one of the things I'm constantly balancing is how do I work on my business and in my business? Mm-hmm. My business is a cult of personality. People want me, people will wait for me, people will pay for me, but I can only work so many hours. So I couldn't grow the business if I'm doing it. So I had to find some of the services, closets. I hired two people who are amazing at it. Garages are another way. It was a service that I could offer where people got the Tracy McCubbin declutter fly experience, but I don't have to do it. So it was a way to go vertical. And that was a big learning like, oh, right, this is something I can hand off, you know, get my team up to speed on it. And, you know, it's a good moneymaker for us. And yep. it's a really good moneymaker. So it's, if you are starting a business, and if you especially are sort of a consulting service, what are the services that somebody else can do, but your clients still feel like they're getting you? Yeah, that's man. You hit it on the head. It's so hard. They want they want you. You are the brand, and it's such a hard thing to break away from, and it's such a hard thing to hand over to trust to other people. Um, oh, I, yeah. yeah, I get it. If, I get it. You know, everybody yep. knows. If you yep. know, you know. It's really yep. been in there, and especially when we're like, "I'll wait." And you're like, "It's a six week wait," and they're like, "I don't care." And I was yeah. like, "Okay." Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> 
Um, explain the moving services. Yeah, that's been a big, that's been our biggest thing during COVID um, because we were essential workers. So we were able to do it. And um, so I started when I start, this is another great uh, entrepreneurial lesson. When I started, I just oversaw the move. So I would just take over, become the client, book the movers, you know, and then we started offering decluttering before people move. So all the stuff you didn't want to take with you, let's get rid of it, not pack it up. Then we would unpack and organize into the new houses. So it was like, okay, we'd oversee, we'd get everything to the new house, we'd unpack and organize. And then I was like, wait, why, if we're doing the decluttering and we're putting things in piles, why don't we just start doing the packing also? So it was another service that I could add that I didn't have to do. So we now declutter, pack, oversee the move and unpack into the new house. And we deal with very complicated situations like going to two houses or we do a lot after people's people have passed away, people's mm -hmm. parents. So, you know, the grown kids have full-time jobs. They can't be here for two weeks. So we'll empty the whole house, get everything shipped across the country. Um, and so it's been a great, so that was another way to realize to go vertical, right? Oh, I, yep. here's another service I can offer. It doesn't take my time. It, it dovetails perfectly. We're decluttering. So we might as well pack anyway. You know, I bought a 17 foot truck. I hired a couple expert packers and it's been a great part of the business. So I always invite people from my own experience to like, what's the, what's the thing that you're outsourcing that could you move it in house and make it part of your vertical? Yep. Yeah. It's such a great service. Cause there's a huge gap there. There are great moving companies and they will provide, oh. you know, the services to pack stuff up but it's just merely taking what's in a cabinet and putting it in a box and taping it up. There's no rhyme or reason. So when you get to the new property, you're like, where's this and where should that, and, and you're moving a yeah. box from that landed in a bedroom that should have been in the kitchen and all. And look, like I work with, I work with moving companies all the time. I, um, you know, they're amazing at what they do. Those, teams work so hard. I, you know, I have great relations. I have about three or four moving local. Oof, well, I have about six cross country and everything. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic. But the story I always tell when people are like, well, why should I hire you versus the movers? Mm -hmm. We're a little more expensive than movers. Not much, $10 an hour. And I tell the story of a client of mine who uh, went, was a musician, went on tour, movers packed all her stuff up, put it in storage. We unpacked for her and it was it was, I unpacked a box and there was literally like a year old half eaten scone and a Starbucks coffee. Oh. And she was like, she was like, Oh, that's where that went. You know, the movers, they just pack everything oh. in sight, right? That's what they do. They're yeah. placed on time, their speed, yep. they're doing it. So for us, we go in, we declutter, we pack in an organized manner so that everything goes in room. So in a way, you know, I tell people, it feels like a more expensive service, but we actually save you on the other mm -hmm. end because yep. it's super organized. We love it. Moving, it's one of my favorite, favorite. And especially, this sounds so strange to say, but helping people after a family member has passed away yep. is, it is one of my favorite services. It's so hard. It's so yep. emotional. It's heartbreaking when, you know, the liquidation company comes in and is like, your China's not worth anything. Your coffee cups aren't worth anything. That's not what, you know, it's heartbreaking. So to be able to honor the legacy of a family, deal with the, you know, not, not, pretty parts. It's just, it's one of my favorite things that we can do for people. Yeah, it really cool. is. Um, so we can talk about that next since you, you kind of moved into that and then we'll get to the last one. So let's talk about the estate decluttering because that yeah. to me is that along with the other one, which is the senior downsizing. To me, those are both very, very sensitive type situations. Like you said, there's emotions that are involved in and these two things. So how do you deal with that? You know, if for me, it's, I view it as such an important service. You know, I, I know how difficult it is. I've had to do it for both my grandparents. Like to, I, I just know that it we're really providing a service that not many people do. And, you know, we, um, my company is very special, you know, we, there are a lot of organizing companies out there, but there's not, I have, 
I've been in this business longer than anybody. I, I know what's valuable. I know what's not valuable. I have the sensitivity. Everyone who's worked for me, you know, we're all a little we're all a little damaged. We all had a little trauma in our childhood. You know, we all have something to draw on. We've all been caregivers to family members. So we have so much respect. Um, I just feel so honored that a family would trust us for this. Um, We just did a family. There were four children Three of the children were on board. The parents lived late into their 90s and it was time, you know, it was time for them to go. And there, you know, there were three of the children were on the same page and one was an outlier. And that that one person was making it very difficult for everybody else. And so to be able to step in and a little bit be the bad guy, like these these books aren't worth anything. Yes, they are, you know, da 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 da. da. And I was like, okay, well, let's get the appraiser in. And then the appraiser's like, they're not worth anything, you know. Right, so being right. able to sort of draw from my Rolodex and and my experience, like I've donated, I've donated thousands of sets of China. It's not worth anything. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm so sorry. It doesn't mean that your holidays when you were growing up weren't important. It doesn't mean that you have the memories that you have. And if you love that China and it brings back those memories, keep it. But if you are keeping it because you think it's the family fortune, then we're going to have a different conversation. So I just feel so honored to be a part of it. I've met such interesting people. And, you know, and this steps into the senior downsizing when we move seniors from lifelong homes into smaller places. Um, A lot of what we're facing when we declutter in these phases is our own mortality, Mm -hmm. right? Oh, right. We're going to all die someday. You know, did my life matter? You know, if I don't have this stuff, did I make an impact? So, you know, it's very, um, I just feel very, very, very lucky that I get to be a part of this process with people. I hear amazing stories. I met amazing people. You know, we always approach it with love and laughter and humor and respect. And it's just a certain, you know, nobody's, nobody does this. Nobody does this. I know I get phone calls all the time. Yeah. It's so it's it's tricky. It's emotional and, and uh, elderly people become a little bit, uh, uh, they don't trust people they don't know you're in their house they shouldn't no no yes, right they yeah, shouldn't right. and so <laughs> they shouldn't. it's a tricky balance yeah one of our favorite things we just did it last week we we've so we're now we you know we've been working for so long we're now helping parents of clients right so a client of mine's mom died i went to nashville to help i went to new york i'm doing that but what we've been doing a lot of which i love is moving someone into an assisted living or you know a community so we like, it's like, we feel like we're on a TV show. We're like, okay, you know, we got 12 hours. And so we got the apartment all set up so that when they're making the move, the drive from the old and they get to the new, their artwork is hung up. The oh, TV's cool. working, their bed is made yeah, yeah. so that they walk into this new experience with familiarity. And we love it. We're like running around sweating, like, do it, do it, do it. Yeah, but yeah. then they walk in and they see their stuff and it's home. They're not stepping into boxes everywhere. Yeah. So this is, this is, it's my favorite part of what we, I mean, I love everything that we do, yeah. but this one's really, it's really important. That's very cool. That, just the way you described that was awesome. Uh, a couple of questions out of the way of the business, and then I want to get into the book, and then I want to get into the, chari- the, the organization, I, and we're running out of time, because <laughs> this is, I, I love this. But, um, it's great. It's great. So if somebody wants to work with your company and in since you're based in California, let's just say somebody here in Arizona, I wanted to hire you to come in and, and clean out my garage. How does somebody <laughs> work with you that isn't in your, like, how do you work to in other States with people? Yeah, we do it. You know, we pay our rates. They just cover travel costs, you know, so okay. we can make it sometimes. Um, Sometimes if I'm in other cities, like in New York, I have two women who I can subcontract to. Sometimes I'll subcontract I'll go myself and maybe bring one of my people and then subcontract to try and use local companies that do that. I have, a, I'm getting a pretty good network. I mean, I'm very, uh, I have very high standards. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm, you know, pretty, I need somebody to be t- tried and true, but I can, I can make it work, but yeah, it's just, it's our same rates. It's not more, it's just the travel cost. So Perfect. a lot of times for people, they're realizing like, Oh, it's actually, you know, the other thing I've started to do for, clients too is if they um 
if they need, like I had a client who had to go to Florida and they just didn't have, he and his sister, their mom passed away. They didn't have the means to pay my travel costs. So I actually helped interview local people for him. So I'll do that for my clients. Like, let me, let me make the first phone calls. Let me have the conversation. And I, um, just cause I'm, I'm very mama bear about my clients. So I want to, I don't want to just go to anybody. <laughs> Perfect. All right. And this, you scared me for a moment because you almost were, it sounded like you were leading into my, my last thing about the business, which is the virtual decluttering. So how do you handle that? Yeah, Is that like you a know, FaceTime walking around with an iPad? Yeah, yeah, room? yeah, yeah, we do. So the virtual decluttering, um, it's been a bit of an experiment to make it work. And what I've found is that we, um, it, it's, um, we have to set very specific goals. So oftentimes we break it up into half an hour sessions. One session is about, all right, here's what you're going to get accomplished. Here's, let's say it's paperwork. You have these four boxes of paperwork what are you going to do with them? Um, I don't as much sit there and sort of go through things with them. It's more about helping them come up with a work plan, what the traps are going to fall into, then a period of time. And then we come back and go over it. And they ask me specific questions about what they got stuck at. So it's really almost the virtual decluttering almost um, becomes a little bit more time management focused, like help you come up with a work plan. How can you get it accomplished? Um, I also you know, have, I have a private Facebook group called conquer your clutter with Tracy McCubbin. It's a free Facebook. I go live pretty much every Wednesday and, um, people can, it, that's a really great, it's a very supportive community. Everybody's read my book. We're all, so sometimes people would join there and the group will help them. So that's, you know, that's great. They're like, okay, it's a lot of accountability this weekend. I'm going to tackle. And that's what the virtual turns out to be too, is a lot of accountability. That's great. Okay, cool. Okay. The book uh, came out in 2019 called Making Space Clutter Free. And you can get it on, I know you can get it on Amazon. I think I saw two other. IndieBound. Indie I think Bound. it's IndieBound. Okay. Yeah. I send people to either Amazon. Um, there's a really great website called bookshop.org okay. and it connects all the independent booksellers so you, it's a clearinghouse. And so if you don't want to give the man who just went into space more of your money, um, bookshop.org is a great way. It's available on Kindle. It's available as an uh, ebook. Uh, it's available as an audio book. I narrate it. Oh, um, great. A lot of, yeah, it was great. A lot of libraries have it. They did a really big push. So your local library has it. Um, and it's great. It's great. It's doing really well. It got to be an Amazon bestseller and, it's an evergreen book. It is not going out of style. That's so awesome. um, yeah, the reviews yeah, are great. Yeah, yeah. So making space clutter free. The nice thing about it is we really delve into the emotional part. So very deep about the emotional part. And then there's an actual work plan, how you tackle the house room by room. Um, so people are really, it's, it's, just, I'm just very, very happy with it. And I'm in the process of writing the second book um, called Make Space for Happiness. And it's, a, it's about why we shop, why we over shop, the holes in our lives that we're trying to fill by shopping. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, cool. I, lo I love it, <laughs> but it's going to be a little controversial. I, right. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like that man who just went into space is not going to like what I have to say, but you know. <laughs> well, I like your thing about the closet that I saw one thing in one thing out, right? Yeah, awesome. there's, it's very practical. It's very, um, you know, it, there's a lot of oversimplified. I think that part of the feedback I always get, and I know from growing up with the parent that I did, um, and also so people understand, a lot of times hoarding is generational. So I, my, I had two other, a great uncle. It's a genetic thing. It's a, it's an anxiety disorder. I think it's a bit of an addiction. I think mm -hmm. that people who hoard get a big dopamine hit when they find something. Um, so there's just a lot of empathy. I'm not judging. I'm not shaming. I under I understand how hard it is. And yeah. so people really respond to that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, one last question. I, I thought it was really cool. You had the, the clutter block quiz on your website and, and, um, there, you talk about blocks, right? Clutter blocks. Uh -huh. Yep. Can you real yep. quickly, can you just 
Sure. This is the crux of the book. So basically a clutter block is an emotional story that we tell ourselves about why we can't let go of what we don't want or need. So it's it. So there are seven of them. And I witnessed this from working with clients for so many. I was like, this is that story again. Wait, this person is that same story. Wait, this is this. So it ranges everything from my stuff keeps me stuck in the past, sentimental things that you can't let go of, the stuff I'm avoiding, which is your paperwork, which is me, that's my clutter block. I'm not worth my good stuff. So not using your nice things, saving mm. them. My fantasy stuff for my fantasy life. Oh, I'm going to become a rock climber. I'm going to knit. I'm going to buy all the <laughs> stuff for this. Um, stuck with other people's stuff. And when you, in the book and in the Facebook group, I talk about it. When you identify, you're like, oh, this is a thing. Uh, the perfect example, last clutter block number seven, the stuff I keep paying for. This is storage unit. You bought the stuff and now you're paying to store it. And when you see it that way, like, oh, I'm paying to store stuff I never use. Oh, it's like, it's, it's illuminated. You know, you're like, oh, this is why it's not, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. This is just, you know, we're humans. We're meaning making machines, right? We just, oh, rains on your wedding day, that, you know, all that stuff. So we make all this meaning out of this stuff that's meaningless and it gets a hold on us. So um, the clutter blocks are really effective for people, really, really effective. Like, oh, this is real. This is, you know, it's not just me. It's not just me. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um before we move off of your business to um, the organization you're part of, which, because I think it's really important to talk about real quick, you've made incredible headway in the press, like, you know, being on the shows that you're on. And for the entrepreneurs that are listening to this, you could have just been another decluttering company in California, right? You've said it yourself, mm -hmm. there's, but you obviously you have a, a unique approach with all the different services you're passionate about it it's very clear by talking with you um and everyone will pick up on that when they listen to this <laughs> and when they watch the youtube video they're going to tell that yeah this is you know this woman is really has the integrity and really loves what she does and it, and it speaks to her how did you get the the press and and all of the stuff that has catapulted you to be the expert in this field I mean, it's, it's amazing yeah, the yeah, shows yeah. you've been on and the podcast it's, and <laughs> yeah, it's great. So I think the thing, the first thing that I got really clear about was a couple things. One, people need content. TV shows need content. Morning news needs content. Podcasts need, everybody needs content. So even if you have a product um, or a service, you know, there's a mission statement behind it. There's a reason that you're doing it. So what's the, what's the story that you can tell about why your service is going to help or or how can you tell your mission statement and not even mention your product if you can talk about the service or what you're offering you know how can you talk about it without even mentioning it then that's the content and people need it and i'll tell you you say yes to everything i have been i mean my favorite story is like morning news show in Temecula, California, like sandwiched in between the Oktoberfest dancers and the like kid who won the spelling bee. Like I said yes to everything. And I worked on my media training. I worked on the messaging. I really understood that you have to be able to communicate it. And so I just started saying yes. And then it, um, you know, I got a reputation for being good and delivering. And I did, I, I have worked with, when the book came out, I did work with a publicist. I found the best person who specializes in um, nonfiction authors. That's the other thing about PR. If you're going to pay for PR, and I, 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 you, sometimes you have to, and you're the two things, you're paying for someone's Rolodex. So who can they call? Mm -hmm. Who do they have connections to? And also you need to find the person who, understands what you do, right? So let's say you have a company where you've invented a new kind of pool cover that will save children's lives. Super important, mm -hmm. needed. Don't hire a publicist who works with beauty products, right? right? Like really 
hone down on, on what you're offering and can that person help it? And sometimes you need to, sometimes you need to pay a marketing person. Sometimes you need to pay a social media manager. We can't do it all. So it's really um, understanding, understanding how valuable those marketing and publicity dollars are right? Because they can get expensive oh, fast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can turn around and I mean, you'll, if people are out there and starting to look at that, you, no problem. Someone will say, oh yeah, we have a $10,000 a month retainer. You'll be like, oh, so, you know, what are their goals? What are their goals for you? How can you help? And I always say this, uh, you can't, for those kinds of positions, um, it's like if you have an agent, right? I have a literary agent who helped me with my book. She takes 10% of my money she does 10% of the work. Mm-hmm. I still got to do the 90%. So you can't dump and run. You can't say, oh, I have a publicist. I don't have to do, no. You are working in conjunction with them. It's your product. No one's going to care more about your business than you are. So show up, say yes to everything. You know, like you can't, you know, be realistic. It's like, well, I want to be on the Good Morning America. Okay, well, you start you know, following the Oktoberfest dancers, <laughs> you just say yes. You say, because yep. first of all, it gives you practice. Yep. It gives you practice and you hone your message. And, you know, and, and this is where the internet is fantastic. Reach out to podcasts, you know, mm-hmm. get really clear about the content you have to offer. Um, you know, just cold call people, cold email people. Here's what I want to say. Like f- people that you listen to, where's the message across? It's, you know, it's the biggest, it's the least fun, the marketing and publicity is the least fun part about running a business, I think, but it's the most important. Yeah. Well, you've done great. It's amazing. And, no, thank and, you. Yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> awesome. Did I miss anything about the business that you would like to talk about before we move on to the organization? The only thing I would say is that if you're out there and if you're struggling with your relationship to your stuff, don't be afraid to find help. Locally, there's lots of people who are opening this business, you know, reach out to me. Uh, I can give you some questions to ask. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Perfect. Okay. One kid, one world. Yeah. It's super cool. I went and looked at the website. I watched the videos. And um, can you explain what it does? Uh, you know, what what the the mission of it is? And then yeah, I don't yeah. want to forget so, after you do that, I want to understand when a volunteer goes, are they just volunteering their time and you get them there and you get them back? Or so let's start with sure. The yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about yeah. So basically quick story. My childhood friend of mine, our dads went to law school together. Um, he went to Darfur and he was in the volunteering in the refugee camps. And he realized that the bulk of the people in the refugee camps were women and children and that they were setting up schools and setting up little shops, like trying to get normalized as much as possible and realizing, as we all know, that education is the key. So we, at, on that trip, he met a Kenyan doctor and nurse. They told him about this girl's school in Kenya that needed a science lab. The girls couldn't take their exams because they didn't have a science lab. So he said to me, it's $25,000. Want to help me raise that? Let's throw a party. You know, our, our peers were all starting to make money and their careers were taking off. So we threw the party, we raised the money. We're like, well, let's just go and see. Let's just go and see what this is. And we went and it was life changing. Here were these girls. And in Kenya, most of them are orphans um, because of HIV AIDS Mm -hmm. and the desire for education. And so there's a lot of organizations that are curriculum based and, you know, this and that. And what we were like, we're like, they don't have desks to sit in. There are no, there's not a room. There's not. So we started focusing on capital improvements. We build buildings, we build dorms, we put desks, we put bookshelves, we pay teacher salaries, we put nurses in the school. Um, We just do the things that they need to stay open. We never build a school from scratch ever. We know nothing about what the community needs. We get in partnership with a community where a school has already been established. We do not affect curriculum, not for us to say. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we try and work in schools that have at least a 50% girl population because girls' education is much underfunded. Um, A big part of what we do is we supply feminine hygiene products to our girls' school because that keeps girls out of school. Um, so we're mo- we work mostly in Kenya, and then um, we have branched out to Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and 
you know, it's an amazing, it's amazing. We're, we started the same year as I started my business. So I did both of those. I, I think we're up to like 26 schools we rebuilt. And part of our fundraising model is we do volunteer trips. So we go, for instance, to Central America, we fly for a long weekend. We rebuild a suite. We don't, we do the big capital improvements before we get there. And then when we're there, we, you know, demolish bathrooms and paint murals and got very, very involved. And for us, what we found is that there's sort of two types of donors. There's the vicarious donors who, you know, friend goes and see the work that the friends do and donate that way. And then there are the people who want to see where the money goes, really make a difference. So when you go on a trip with us, you, uh, you commit to raising a certain amount of money when you come back. And we always hit our goals. Um, we never operated a deficit. We don't ever take on projects that we can't finish. Um, we're very lucky both Josh and I have other businesses, so we work for free. We don't take mm -hmm. a salary. So we're at like, I think we're at like 98% of every dollar we raise goes back. In. And not that, not that I don't think that nonprofit workers should not be paid. They absolutely mm -hmm. should be, but we choose for us, we choose not to. Right. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been great. It's been one of, you know, where a couple of years ago, our first round of girls started to go to college and nursing school and technical school. And um, it's, it's really amazing. It's really, really, really amazing. COVID has been really hard. We haven't been able to go. I think next spring will be our first trip if everything goes okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been a really amazing, uh, it's been an amazing thing to be a part of. It's been an amazing thing to be a part of. Yeah, it was really cool. I watched the video and I saw um, where there was a person taking Polaroids and then everyone and then the Polaroid was there was a square where the Polaroid would go on the piece of paper and each student had to say, I'm going to be a doctor like, with yeah, the, or I'm going to be a nurse or it was, it was really cool. Well, one of the funny things like I, I invented invented this exercise or, you know, I, I was realizing talking to the girls in Kenya that because they didn't have parents, so many of them, they didn't they never, they didn't know how to make a business phone call. They didn't know how to apply for a job because it's like the teachers are teaching them, but there's not that. So I, we started to do this exercise where they would be the shop owner and I'd be like another volunteer. And I, I like, I'd be the bad, like I wouldn't say, you know, I'd say my name really quiet and I wouldn't shake a hand. And you just did these role-playing exercises of how to apply for a job, you know, and you realize like you have to learn that stuff. You don't know, you don't know how to, call someone and say, Hey, here's my name or walk into a shop or, you know, say like, I'd like a job and walk in with confidence. And so now it's like everybody, they can't wait. Every time we go, it's like, that's, they all line yeah, up and they cool. all get to pretend. And, you know, it's such a, it's such an amazing, just right. To have the self-confidence to, you know, get, go in there and, and do that. And so it's very practical and we love it. We love That's it. Awesome. We're, we love it. We can't wait to get back. So I'm if anybody sure. out there is listening and want to come on a trip with us, one kid, one world.org, tell me you heard me on here and would love to get you. Awesome. Okay. Um, I've taken your time. I've gone over. I apologize. <laughs> um, That's all right, Joe. We've been having a great conversation. This, this was awesome. So let's give everyone the, uh, and I'll put it in the show notes, but um, the website for your business, Declutterfly. Yep. Yep. So the website is declutterfly.com. So it's D C L U T T E R F L Y.com. See, this is why you say it out yeah. before you <laughs> name your business. Um, the clutter block quiz is on there. You can sign up for my newsletter. Um, it's a great place to find me. I'm very active on Instagram. So Tracy underscore McCubbin. And then if you're looking for some extra love and support, the private Facebook group, which is called Conquer Your Clutter with Tracy McCubbin. Come join us over there. It's an amazing group of people. Lots of love, lots of support. Everybody's struggling with the same stuff. It's such a safe space. So I'd love to see people over there. Well, perfect. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. I think we All had right. a great time. All right. Awesome. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you. This was a treat. Your entrepreneurial wisdom is going to be invaluable to the listeners. And then all of the other stuff was just icing on the cake. Um, and I wish you the best. Uh, again, super impressed with all of 
the press that you have and watching those videos, you're really good on camera, which you already know because you're an actress. So <laughs> we don't have to. So uh, again, you know what it is? It's more. Yeah, I have a little bit of training, but it's more. I believe in what I'm talking yeah. about. Espe- you know, and it's funny. I never thought of myself as an entrepreneurial expert because I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, and then I was like, oh no, I have made a bunch of mistakes. Like <laughs> I'm very passionate about, and I say it, I'm an accidental entrepreneur, but it, it, it's so like, I, I was like, oh no, I learned this. Like I really lived it. And so it's great. So those people who are thinking of doing it, and yeah, if you've got a good idea, there's a reason. If If there's something, my grandmother used to tell me about this you know, when she bought stocks, she would only buy stocks in products that companies that she used. So in the 50s, she bought a little stock called IBM because mm-hmm. she liked it. She bought a little stock in Apple because she liked Apple. She was like, that's a cute name for a company, right? She saw me using the computer. She did very well. So if there's a if there's a service or a product that you wish you had access to, do it. Yep. Great advice. Love it. Tracy, it's been a treat. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Have a great day. You too. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I want to thank you for listening to my podcast. I know you have many options to listen to various podcasts and I'm honored that you chose to listen to mine. I would love it if you would rate my podcast five stars and write a nice review. It really helps to bring up the rankings of the podcast to other listeners. Once again, Thank you so much for listening to The Joe Costello Show. I appreciate you very much.